Hello and good evening. My name is Reed Tuxen, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another in our series of Making It Plain, a COVID-19 town hall for minority health professionals. Welcome to you and thank you all for joining us on what we sure will be an information rich evening. We're gonna cover a lot of ground tonight. We're gonna to be moving quickly as we explore topics that will include forecasts from the experts on where this pandemic is today and where it will be in a few months from now. Updates on the epidemiological trends, vaccine supply and dissemination strategies from the experts at the White House and the CDC, updates on the science underlying vaccines. And we will also explore the increasingly important topic of therapeutics such as monoclonal antibodies. And we'll end with, uh, with uh, guidance on how uh, health professionals can better communicate with their patients and the public about vaccine acceptance. I wanna thank our sponsors, Bio, Henry Schein and J&J Janssen and also our federal officials and guest presenters. Uh, for those of you, uh, because we will be going fast tonight, uh, that want to review the program, it will be available tomorrow at 10 o'clock on the blackdoctor.org, that's blackdoctor.org website. And also you will be able to find it archived on YouTube and Facebook. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce for his welcome, Dr. Leon McDougal, president of the National Medical Association. Thank you, Reed. I'd just like to start things off by acknowledging the Black Coalition Against COVID members, the Consortium of Four Black Medical Schools, Howard Meharry, Charles R. Drew, and also Morehouse. In addition, the National Medical Association, the National Black Nurses Association, the Montague Cobb NMA Health Institute, and the National Urban League, along with blackdoctor.org. Furthermore, I'd like to acknowledge our professional society sponsors for tonight's town hall, including the Association of Black Cardiologists, the National uh, Hispanic Medical Association, the Association of American Indian Physicians, the National Council on Asian and Pacific Islander Physicians, also joining us, the National Dental Association, the National Pharmaceutical Association, and the National Association of Social Black Social Workers. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McDougal, for that, and also for a special welcome. Given the uh, what's happening in the American society today, we are pleased that Dr. Winston Wong, Chair and Acting CEO of the National Council of Asian and Pacific Islander Physicians is with us, Dr. Wong. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Tuxin, and thank you for your leadership, and particularly for this invitation from blackdoctors.org. It is certainly a difficult time across our nation. The events in Atlanta have precipitated uh, a reckoning with regards to the issues facing Asian Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians across our country. I wanted just to express my uh, thanks to all of the audience with regards to being in the front lines, caring for all of our communities, particularly communities of color. Also wanted to just share with you that if you go to our website and cap it, ncapip.org, you'll find a statement that we issued last week signed by 222 public health and clinical leaders across the API diaspora in the United States highlighting some of the issues that I think we'll hear about later today. One is with regards to the impact of COVID-19 on our particular communities, a story that has not well been told. The fact that many of our healthcare professionals are uh, actually disproportionately dying from COVID-19. For example, 30% of the nursing deaths among COVID-19 victims in California were of Filipino descent. Also in Arkansas, that there's a four county region that is uh, dominated by deaths of Marshall Lees. These are issues that haven't been really covered by the press, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to cover it during the course of this next hour or so. I also just wanted to express that as healthcare professionals side by side with you caring for communities, Asian Pacific Islander for healthcare professionals have been victims of assaults and confrontations with regards to our ancestry, which is really a double whammy with regards to not only how COVID-19 is affecting our community, 
but the discrimination that we face just as individuals in this society and for Asian Pacific Islanders in terms of being part of the fabric of the United States and being fully accepted. So I think these issues are so critical, not only for the API community, for, but for all the communities that are vulnerable that are confronting COVID-19 and all its devastation. So um, thank you for inviting me and, and providing some introductory remarks. Uh, I've been reached out to by a number of individuals, uh, including the organizations that are part of tonight's uh, presentation. It's been very meaningful and um, it's a testimony to our unity in terms of confronting this pandemic. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong, we appreciate it. And now, uh, Ellis, if we can have the, uh, the presentation with Dr. Zwin and Carlos Del Rio. Well, I can't think of a better way to start our town hall tonight with two of the most distinguished uh, analysts and voices uh, that we've had uh, commenting on all manner of this pandemic since day one. Uh, I'm really pleased that Dr. Lena Nguyen uh, and Dr. Carlos Del Rio are joining us for this uh, conversation to start our show. Uh, Dr. Wynn is a visiting, visiting professor, distinguished fellow at the Fitzhugh Mullen Institute of Healthcare, Health Workforce Equity. She's a former commissioner for, of health for the city of Baltimore and a regular contributing analyst on our major media outlets. Dr. Carlos Del Rio, the Hubert Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health at the Rollins School of Public Health, a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory University School of Medicine, and a principal investigator and co-director of the Emory Center for AIDS Research and co-PI of the Emory CDC HIV Clinical Trials Unit. Let me start uh, with you, uh, uh, Dr. Wynn, and uh, give us a picture of what, what is the data saying about the epidemiological status of where we are? Are we in a good place or are we headed to a dangerous place? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be on and thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing every day, Reed, and, and everyone else um, who is part of this conversation as well. Certainly Dr. Del, Del Rio, who I have so much re respect for as a colleague too. As we have been saying throughout the pandemic, where we go from here depends on us. And I believe that we're at a crossroads of sorts. On the one hand, we are seeing vaccines rolled out at record speed. Now we're at between two to three million vaccinations done per day here in the US, which is really incredible. And just the fact that we have three safe and highly effective vaccines already is really incredible in and of itself. But at the same time, we also have more contagious variants, some of which are variants of concern that may render the vaccines that we have less e effective. And we also have a, an environment where people are letting down their guard, pandemic fatigue has set in, and states are removing re restrictions and mitigation measures that have been keeping the infection in check. And so I think we're at this crossroads where what happens in the next several weeks and months will largely depend on people's behavior now. That's very helpful. And, and Dr. Del Rio, your comments as well. And, and as you make your general comments, uh, something that Dr. Wynn uh, mentioned about the variants perhaps being um, having a profound effect on, on some of our current vaccines. I know you've been doing some research in that area at Emory. You might want to comment on that as well. Uh, yes, absolutely. Reed. Well, first of all, thank you for having me uh, with you this evening. I would say a couple of things. Uh, I totally agree with, with Dr. Wynn. Uh, we are going quite well in our vaccinations. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're vaccinating in our country about 2.5 million people a day, about 25 to 30% of Americans have gotten at least one shot, but that still puts us far for where we need to be to really feel comfortable. And at this point in time, I think it's premature to loosen restrictions or ending them, quite frankly. I think many states who have not only eliminated mass mandates, but actually said everything is open, I was looking at this morning about the situation in Florida with spring breakers and everybody, you know, very crowded environments. We, we run the risk of having a fourth wake. Europe is already having a fourth wake wave. I think it's time for us to take this uh, seriously because we're so close to the, to the end. I mean, you know, I like sports analogies and we're in the seventh inning. Let's win this game. There's not much left to, to be done if we do it correctly. But as far as the variants, you know, the most concerning one in my mind is the variant in the UK, also called the B117 variant that came from the UK, is now becoming very prevalent, it's highly transmissible. Uh, CDC estimates that sometime this week or next, it becomes it will become the dominant strain in our country. 
And it produces a lot more transmission cases and therefore leads to a lot more infected individuals. And it probably also causes more severe disease and, and higher mortality. So we don't want that strain to spread. And the way you prevent viruses from spreading is by stopping transmission, vaccination, masking, socially distancing, avoiding crowding environments. That's what we need to do for a couple more months. Months. It is time to hang on just a little bit longer. Let's get through the summer. Let's get everybody vaccinated. We'll be in a very different place. But as Dr. Wen said, it's up to us. Great. And uh, by the way, on that, uh, in terms of the research that you've been doing uh, at Emory there on some of the effects of the vaccine and whether or not uh, the vaccines are leaving us with enough of, of antibodies that are counting the impact of some of the variants. Uh, any comments on that work? Well, you know, it looks like the, 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 the currently available vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and, and J&J, the, the Janssen vaccine, are effective against the B117 variant, the one we've been talking about. But they're not as effective against the South African variant, also called the B1351 variant. And that is what is also concerning because that variant has already been identified in New York and Florida. We have it here as well in Georgia. And if that variant becomes spreading, the vaccine is simply not as effective against that variant. So overall, vaccines are currently good for the variants we have. They may not be as good for subsequent variants. We will have more prominent in our country. Again, stopping transmission is the key to ending the variants. Dr. Wynn, you have uh, been uh, following, I think, the work on one of the new vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I wonder what your thoughts are. Are you uh, optimistic that this will be another element in our portfolio or are there uh, some concerns? Well, there has just been um, very good news released about the AstraZeneca trial here in, in the U.S. that it appears that this vaccine is 79% effective at preventing symptomatic disease. It looks like it's 100% effective at preventing severe enough disease to cause hospitalization and death. And I think also very important is that there were no substantial safety signals that occurred in the U.S. study, especially after the concerns that arose in the U.K. and in um, and, and Europe around maybe um, some rare um, cases of, of blood clots. Um, and so I do think that this vaccine is very important because it's the vaccine that's been um, said to be the vaccine for the world, as in it is relatively inexpensive. It can be stored and transported at regular refrigerator temperatures. Um, it's one that many countries are really depending on um, as part of the as part of their toolbox. So I think it's a good thing um, that this vaccine, that there is is um, now um, uh, good data about this vaccine here in the US. Um, I think that um, there are still some issues to be re resolved in particular about this particular vaccine and variants because there have been some studies that looked at the efficacy of this vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, as it targets the um, the variants coming out of South uh, South, South Africa and Brazil, the, the B1351 and P1. And I think that um, there's some concern that this, that this vaccine may not be as efficacious against those variants. Excellent. Outstanding. Dr. Del Rio, your thoughts on that as well, please. Yes, I'm very happy to hear about the AstraZeneca results from the U.S. study. I'm even more looking forward to seeing their regulatory package when they submit it to the FDA if they're seeking emergency use authorization, because the FDA has been very transparent in, in making those regulatory packages available to everybody. You can find them in, in the Internet. And I look forward to really looking at the data and digging into the data. And again, I, I, I trust our FDA. They have very good scientists there. Also, the Vaccine and, and Biologicals uh, uh, Advisory Committee is, is really excellent. So at the end of the day, they'll, they'll look at the data and they'll make a recommendation. If the FDA uh, approves this vaccine for use, I will be delighted. We will have a fourth vaccine. But globally, this is an incredibly useful vaccine, as Dr. Wen said. And, and again, we need to think as Americans, this is not just about vaccinating the U.S. This epidemic will not be over until we vaccinate everybody. We have to end it globally. So we need to be looking at vaccinating beyond the U.S. borders. Well, as we close out our conversation with you both, that's a great segue, uh, Dr. Del Rio, to, the, to my asking you both to uh, leave us with a, a parting comment to this audience. As you know, this is an incredibly interesting audience of multicultural physicians uh, from every part of the uh, of, of, of minority health world, and I'm sure some of the majority physicians as well. What would you say to your colleagues, Dr. Wynn, as you close out, the one message you want to leave to your professional colleagues? 
Hmm. Well, in addition to thanking Dr. Tuxen for your wonderful work and, and the work that, that all of you do every day, um, I would say that here's my major concern. My major concern is that what's going to prevent us from reaching herd immunity and ending this pandemic once and for all is actually one thing here in the US, and that is vaccine hesitancy. Uh, thanks to the work of the Biden administration, we will have enough vaccine supply and we are rapidly increasing our rate of administration of the vaccine. But I really worry about lack of confidence in the vaccine. And of course, we know that this is not a monolith. It's not that people who are vaccine hesitant all have one concern. There are many concerns. Access right now is also a major issue. And I think we need to overcome this particular issue as well and help to make vaccination the easy choice by bringing vaccines in time to churches, to schools, to workplaces, wherever it is that people are so that we're solving the access and convenience issue. But overcoming distrust, overcoming skepticism, that's the work that we all have to do. And study after study shows that it's not necessarily politicians and celebrities who are going to be um, the most critical in affecting this change. It's all of us as the people, the providers on the ground who are going to be making the difference. And so I commend you in advance um, for doing this work and look forward to working on this critical issue with you. Thank you so much. Dr. Del Rio. I would like to just reinforce that. Uh, study after study shows that the most trusted source of information is a trusted healthcare provider, your physician, your advanced practice provider, your nurse. So we as healthcare providers need to be not only getting vaccinated, but we also need to be promoting vaccination among our patients, among our families, among our peers, because, because we are trusted sources of information. And if we say get vaccinated, people will get vaccinated. So we need to become vaccine champions. We need to become vaccine advocates. This is something that we cannot let others do. We are part of that solution. And we have a very critical role as healthcare providers to, to decrease, increase vaccine access and vaccine uptake. It is up to us. Thank you so much to both of you. You've got our program off to a flying start. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. And, and let me say to uh, uh, all of our colleagues, I inadvertently said that I welcome them to make a message to their physician colleagues. And of course, uh, let me be very clear how excited we are that our colleagues from nursing, uh, dentistry, uh, from uh, pharmacy, and from social work are also with us. Did not mean to leave you out uh, of that conversation. And now it's my pleasure to engage in, uh, in a conversation with, the, with members from the White House COVID response team and the Centers for Disease Control, where we will get into the issues uh, further into epidemiology, but also into vaccine supply and the challenges and opportunities for vaccine administration as we try to get needles into arms. We're joined by Dr. Bachera Choker, former Commissioner of Public Health for the City of Chicago and is the White House Vaccinations Coordinator. We also are, are joined by Dr. Cameron Webb, and a good friend of this program, as is Bashara, who currently serves as Senior Policy Advisor for Equity on the White House COVID-19 Response Team. Previously, Dr. Webb was an Assistant Professor of Medicine and Public Health Sciences and Director of Health Policy and Equity at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And we're also joined by our good friend, Dr. Amanda Cohn, Chief Medical Officer for the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And let me start with you, Dr. Cohn. Uh, can you please give us an update on where you see the epidemiological data telling us? What are the stats? What are the trends? Where are we headed? Sure, and um, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for having me back. Uh, it's been more than a year since the WHO uh, declared uh, this global pandemic. And uh, I am seeing the light of, at the end of the tunnel, um, but it's going to take all of us to get there as Dr. Del Rio and uh, Wen just talked about. I'm gonna give a high level overview of the epidemiology. We are in a better place than we were um, a couple of months ago. So over the past nine weeks, we've had declining seven day case averages. So we're now seeing about 53,000 cases a day. And that compares to our peak on January 11th of nearly 250,000 cases um, a day. So we are doing better. However, over the last couple of weeks, that rate of declining has um, been more steady than it was. So we're not continuing to see uh, decreases as, as wide. It was only a 3% decrease this past week. 
um, and we need to keep seeing decreases to reduce transmission and get uh, and give us time to get everyone vaccinated. Um, we uh, do. Uh, we've we're, we're now uh, reaching uh, 540,000 deaths, uh, nearly, and 80% uh, of those uh, deaths are in persons uh, 65 years and older. And we are seeing a disproportionate number of deaths, cases, and hospitalizations in persons who are Black, Hispanic, or American Indian and Alaska Native um, communities. And so um, this uh, remains a really critical group of uh, communities and people to uh, protect with vaccines. Um, we have some uh, sheds of, of, of good light in our vaccine data. Um, we are, as uh, uh, Dr. Del Rio and Wen uh, said, we're, we're about 2.5 million doses a day. We have several days per week where we're reaching over 3 million doses a day. Um, but I really want to see us reaching towards 4 million doses a day um, as supply increases, uh, which my colleagues will talk about in a little bit. Um, so over 82 million people have received one dose of vaccine. And so that is about one in four people, but it's about 32% of adults over the age of 18. And it's nearly 75% of person, I mean, excuse me, nearly 70% of persons uh, 65 years of age and older uh, have received at least one dose. And so that's really good news. And, and I can give you, um, there are certainly signs in our epidemiology uh, which we are looking at really carefully, uh, but they're very hopeful signs that we're seeing bigger declines in that older age group, um, 65 years of age and older than we're seeing in other age groups, which um, may be attributed to vaccines. So that's really um, incredible news, uh, but we have uh, much further uh, to go. Um, we uh, know that um, there is a lot more work to do, particularly in communities of color, uh, and uh, one of the most important things we can do as vaccine eligibility expands and supply increases is to leave no person behind. So to make sure that people are continually offered vaccine who may not have been comfortable getting vaccinated when they were offered in January or may not have access to get vaccines. We have to make sure that we can um, not only encourage and reduce vaccine hesitancy, but also make sure that every person has access um, and continued access to COVID vaccines until we can get everyone vaccinated. Well, let me turn to Dr. Webb on that very point, because you've been leading a lot of the effort for the White House on this vaccine equity challenge. Uh, where, how do you see that? How concerned are you? And do you see opportunities ahead? Well, I think I think until equity is achieved, we always have to be concerned, right? We always have to press toward that mark. And I think that what Dr. Cohn just raised is a really great way to frame it. It's those two pieces of making sure we can get shots in arms, which include making sure that everyone has access to these vaccines and making sure we're addressing challenges with vaccine confidence. Those are the two keys to making sure that we can have an equitable vaccine distribution process. And, and I always lead with the access part because it's hard to tell somebody that, uh, that the reason that they're not getting vaccinated is because of their attitude or because of their, their views on, on how, uh, how confident they are if we're not actually uh, offering that vaccine to them. So we have to start with the access component at the same time, build up that confidence piece. But if you look at the numbers, you know, we still have some room to go. We still are, uh, you know, if you look at just the, the raw data, we only have race and ethnicity data on just north of 60% of, uh, of all of the vaccinations here in the United States. So we're continuing to press that number forward. We're working with the states to make sure we're getting more information back because we need to know who's being vaccinated and who's not. And if you look by racial and ethnic uh, you know, category or demographic, we have a lot of room to go for pretty much every community of color. And so we have so much work to do. The key to it, again, is making sure there's access and making sure that we're addressing the confidence challenges. And on the access front, there's a lot of programs that the Biden-Harris administration uh, are, are executing. Of course, you have Dr. Shukare here as well, but between our federal community vaccination centers, our retail pharmacies program, our, our federally qualified health centers programs, even our mobile units, we have a lot of different mechanisms that are specifically designed to press toward equity. Before I get to Dr. Shukare, let me just ask you, would you suggest it would be useful for the audience members, these trusted health professionals to contact their local government agencies, their local health department and request two things. One, should they request that data be collected on uh, by race and ethnicity so that we can track it? And number two, should they be advocating 
uh, for, uh, for, for vaccine dissemination more convenient to their communities. Is this something you would endorse? Well, Dr. Tuxin, you've known me a long time, so you've known that I'm always I'm always uh, on, on the side of advocacy. Uh, certainly, uh, as, you know, as providers, you know, health professionals across uh, the spectrum the, in the interdisciplinary space, uh, we all know that more data is going to be helpful to us, and the more we can encourage our local and state governments to be in this pro be a part of this process of making sure we have complete data, the better. So, uh, but but you know, of course, you know, providers in all of our communities, we know what we need to advocate for. You're the eyes and ears on the ground. You know where the gaps are in your communities. So not only are you, you know, should you certainly continue to advocate locally, advocate with us at the federal level. Let us know how we can be helpful to you because, you know, we all have to work together and ultimately equity, I say it all the time, you know, they say all politics is local, but all equity work is inherently local. So we have to look at this as close to the ground as we can. Great, thank you. And Dr. Bashir, how do you uh, think we're doing on fulfilling the president's pledge? As I remember it, that pledge is that by no later than May 1st, any adult, regardless of age, occupation, or health status, will be able to sign up to receive the vaccine. Well, thank you, Dr. Tuxin, for having me here. And it's always great to be with you, Amanda and Pam. Um, well, let me, let me just start by saying that um, you know, when we got into office, um, we the president asked us to purchase additional vaccine doses, and we purchased 200 million more doses of Moderna and Pfizer, 100 million doses of Moderna, 100 million doses of Pfizer, for a total of 600 million doses of Pfizer and Moderna. And then in February, J&J &J got approved, and we have 100 million doses of J&J, &J, and we purchased another 100 doses of J&J. &J. And because of all of these purchases, we're going to have enough vaccine to vaccinate all adults in this country by the end of May. And as you heard the president, he's asked and he's directed states, tribes, territories to make sure that all adults become eligible for vaccination on May 1st. That doesn't mean, um, uh, Reed, that everybody is going to get a shot on May 1st, but that means that everybody becomes eligible. And as we get more and more supply out into our communities, we would want to make sure that uh, we have enough vaccinators and we have enough places for people to get vaccinated. And that's an integral part of our work with states, with tribes, with territories, with the healthcare system to make sure that there are enough places for people to get vaccinated. Great. And what about booster shots? Uh, do, what happens if we find that we're going to need those? Is that going to be, is that something you have anticipated? Are you planning for it? Well, let me uh, let me start on the boosters, um, you know, shots. We know that the higher the titer is when it comes to the antibodies, um, the more um, effective we're going to be um, against some of the variants that are out there. So it's really important that we, uh, one, we for the two dose vaccines, we make sure that we're getting the, the second dose uh, vaccine. I do anticipate as we continue, and we know that the body, that the titers are going to be good for at least six months. We're going to continue to monitor that um, as time goes along, but that we might be getting to a point where we might need um, an additional booster. And that might look like one of two options. It could be a booster of the same vaccine to kind of boost your, your, um, um, your titers, your antibody titers, or it might be a specific uh, booster to target some of the variants that are out there. We know there are lots of studies out there right now. We're going to trust the scientists to do what they do best. And then when the FDA comes back and tell us, and when the CDC makes the recommendations, we know we'll be ready to roll up our sleeves and roll up um, what, what's important to happen. Great. Thank you. Two quick questions uh, for this panel before we wrap up. Dr. Cohn, let me ask uh, you, um, how concerned are you about the global trends? And uh, what is that telling you in, in your significant role at CDC? I'm concerned, but not surprised by the global trends. Uh, we, uh, this is a, a virus that is just incredibly contagious and we have to do uh, more than anything, you know, more mitigation than we anticipated to, uh, to keep transmission uh, low. And we have this new variant that's more transmissible and um, just exquisitely contagious. Uh, there will be uh, increased travel likely over the coming weeks where we're entering summer, we have pandemic fatigue, uh, we're already seeing news about over a million travelers a day. And every time people move from place to place, 
that gives more opportunities for different uh, viruses to uh, spread in different communities. So um, I remain concerned, uh, but hopeful that we will get our vaccination coverage up uh, uh, by the beginning of the summer, if not, you know, middle of the summer, so that people are protected against potential spread or a potential uh, uh, next wave. Um, and I am really confident in both the safety and the effectiveness of these vaccines and, um, and, and hopeful that it will prevent what we're seeing, uh, starting to see in other parts of the world uh, uh, come back to the U.S. Great. Thank you. And uh, very quickly, uh, Cameron Webb, um, uh, what are you, I know you've been working hard on working with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations and private doctor's offices. Do you see those three entities, the CBOs, the FBOs, and private doctor's offices as being a key element of the overall plan? Yeah, without a doubt. I think that, um, you know, it's pretty clear, and we've seen this from across the states, and, and part of my work, and, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't Mentioned Dr. Marcella Nunes Smith, who I work really closely with, who's a senior advisor to the COVID response team and, and also the chair of the Health Equity Task Force, the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. And for both of us, we do a lot of engagement across the country in talking to states. We hear this over and over again, that some of the greatest success they have in addressing equity challenges are through partnerships, strategic partnerships with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations, because, you know, we say it all the time, but trusted messengers, trusted messages, safe spaces, trusted places to get vaccinated, that's a recipe for community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to have a key role. And I think our, our job, our task here is to figure out exactly how all the pieces come together, federal government, states, localities, and then these organizations, but uh, absolutely a role to play. Well, let me thank all three of you. Oh, yes, Dr. Bashar. No, I, I was just going to add just briefly, uh, Dr. Tuxin, I, I think you've mentioned the role of, of uh, physicians, and I can't stress how important the role of physicians is going to be and providers in general, particularly when it comes to people who might not be as confident in the vaccine or who might be curious about the vaccine, and they're maybe not ready today to go and stand up in a community vaccination center line or go to a pharmacy, but they need that conversation with their doctor. So for the audience here, I would encourage you to also engage with your local health department, your state health department, to make sure that physician and provider's practices are an integral part of the vaccination plan for your jurisdiction. So just wanted to add that oh, as well. Oh man, listen, uh, you could not have been better scripted because I'm literally going to turn now to the members of each of these societies across the health professionals to uh, to say some things to you all. So while, oh, you, you, leave the, uh, while you leave the uh, studio, uh, we'll bring them in, but I want you, uh, I know that your staffs and your teams are listening and you will be listening on uh, Facebook, uh, live or YouTube to hear what your colleagues have to say to you all. So thank you because we, uh, you, you couldn't have done better. Thanks to our three uh, opening panelists. We really appreciate it. And now let me bring back Dr. Leon McDougall uh, from the National Medical Association for his very brief uh, perspective on the role of, of, of black physicians. Yes, uh, very important. And as more people are uh, given permission to be vaccinated, that makes it more pertinent that Black physicians are included. I'm a family physician. We uh, immunize uh, adolescents, uh, uh, children, adults, and uh, in those communities with Black doctors, we really are those trusted messengers to help uh, break down any uh, uh, issues with vaccine confidence and also provide access. So it's very important, Reed. Thank you for that very much, Dr. McDougall. And let me bring in Dr. Brian Thompson, who is a member of the American Indian uh, Medical Society. Uh, he is also a, a member of the AIP Policy and Legislative Committee, past member of the board, and also uh, uh, my friend uh, Brian is also um, uh, uh, also a practicing uh, obstetrician gynecologist and uh, a professor of OBGYN at Upstate Medical University. And by the way, Brian, the appropriate name is the Association of American Indian Physicians. And of course, I know that better and shouldn't have messed it up. <laughs> well, thank you again, Sigoli Scano. And, uh, and thank you again from the uh, this opportunity from the land of the Haudenosaunee, Upstate New York. Uh, one of the uh, world's original and, and uh, oldest uh, democracies in the world. 
And thank you again, Dr. Tuxen and blackdoctor.org uh, for allowing the opportunity of, of, of native uh, uh, voice uh, to the uh, table. And, and we really deeply appreciate it. Uh, and also welcome from the Association of American Indian Physicians, uh, voice of native physicians across the United States. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has affected the native community uh, uh, just like every other uh, uh, community of color. Uh, unfortunately, about one in 475 Native Americans have died of COVID uh, in the United States. And uh, we have uh, high rates of mortality, high rates of incidence. Uh, but one of the fortunate things that we do have is a higher rate of vaccine acceptance. Uh, the Urban Indian Health Institute uh, has uh, uh, performed a study where they looked at the, uh, the incidence of, of Native Americans across the United States accepting vaccine. And uh, it's uh, been reported to be 75%. So approximately three quarters of Native Americans are, are taking the vaccine. Uh, the Indian Health Service, which provides health care for Native Americans in the United States, uh, has administered over 850,000 vaccines uh, so far. So we've been uh, very excited about that. And uh, uh, thank you again uh, for the opportunity uh, for, uh, for discussing uh, Native uh, issues. Well, thank you, uh, Brian, for being a part of this. And I have to say that we do not in this country uh, feature enough of the voice from, from the Native American community. And it is exceedingly important uh, that you joined us. And I thank you for, for bringing those comments. Uh, let me come back to now Dr. Wong um, to uh, give the perspective uh, from, from your com com uh, community. Yeah, uh, Dr. Tuxin and, and greetings, uh, Dr. Thompson, who's a close colleague of mine. Um, you know, I, I'm going to start with a personal story. Um, I stood in front of Chinese Hospital in San Francisco with my mother, who's 91 years old, to get tested for COVID-19 about four months ago. And she was scared that she might have been exposed. But the reason I mention that is we stood in front of Chinese Hospital, uh, which was established about 130 years ago. And it was established because there were no hospitals in San Francisco that allowed Chinese to be seen within their walls. In other words, there's been apartheid across our nation, not only for African Americans, not only for other communities of color, but certainly Asian communities. So we see that pattern again with regards to where we are with regards to vaccination and, and testing in the current pandemic. Not that we have blatant apartheid, but I think that the walls that we have with regards to really access for people who do not speak English, who do not live in the mainstream of the United States in terms of being white collar workers are very vulnerable to not having the access that Dr. Wen had mentioned. Uh, for example, you know, much has been said about Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium is a, is a site where um, thousands of people are projected and targeted to get vaccinated. Well, about half a mile, three quarters of a mile away from Dodger Stadium is Los Angeles Chinatown. And I really wonder how much of the Chinatown residents in that community just walk over to Dodger Stadium, which is queued up with hundreds of cars to get vaccinated. I don't think that really happens. And I don't think mes many of the speakers uh, and the uh, practitioners in Dodger Stadium speak Cantonese, Toisan, Mandarin, et cetera. I know from uh, uh, words from the community health centers in Oakland, Chinatown, when they set up a vaccination clinic in a senior housing complex, their uptake is remarkable. They're able to vaccinate hundreds of people over the course of a few hours in a small setting in a community-based senior housing project. My point being, and I think it was said earlier, is that we really need to embrace the unique aspects of our communities, Asian Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian, obviously, in terms of really having uh, people who speak their language, who understand their questions, provide security, and now in the face of anti-Asian hate, to provide a safe haven where people feel that they can even venture outside of their homes and get vaccinated. 
Um, so those are some of the salient points. And, and certainly with regards to the events over the last uh, several months and most acutely in Atlanta, people are afraid in our community. And I think we need to be able to safeguard uh, their opportunity to just go out and, and, and tend to their health, much less the chores of daily living. Thank you so much, Winston. Really appreciate it. And thanks again. And now let me turn to Dr. Nareda Correa, uh, Associate Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Women's Health, Family and Social Medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Chairwoman of the Board of the National Hispanic Medical Association. Dr. Correa. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting us. It's my pleasure to be here representing National Hispanic Medical Association. Uh, we at the National Hispanic Medical Association are very, very concerned about our uh, communities of color, especially African American and Latinos, who have been very disproportionately affected by this pandemic. Uh, not only are they um, getting the disease, but they're also dying at greater rates than are represented in their community. We at NHMA have started a vaccine for all campaign uh, with part partnering with CDC and other agencies to see if we can increase uh, the acceptance of the vaccine. Because to our surprise, many of the African-American and Latino, even health workers, have just declined to take the vaccine. And, you know, although we can understand that hesitancy because of our history, it's very important uh, for our communities to know that they can be vaccinated. The other thing is facilitating the ability to get a vaccine. Uh, if you don't have computer competency, or if you have, as someone mentioned before, language problems and don't understand uh, what's being said, it's going to be difficult or impossible. So we are encouraging our young people. Uh, we represent physicians all across the United States that young people get involved in helping the elderly and those who do not have competency. We're also very concerned about our immigrant populations and the fact that at the border, there are people that are not only being exposed, but also not having access to any kind of care or attention. Um, we, uh, we're encouraging the vaccination. That's the main thing. Uh, we are fresh. We just had our, uh, our national conference last week, and we are fresh and energized to tackle this battle and very sad that COVID-19 had to happen and that we have been shut down and not be able to, to be in person. So thank you for having us represented here. And um, I'll open to questions. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Craig. We really appreciate your involvement. And now I'll turn to another panel of uh, others of our health professional colleagues. And our first panel can uh, go ahead and exit the uh, broadcast studio to allow others space to get in. And I'm happy to, to invite Dr. Martha Dawson, president of the National Black Nurses Association, uh, for her comments and perspective. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Reed. It's great to be here again with you all. Uh, I think what we're seeing as nurses is that we've been educated now ever since uh, back in the summer. And so finally we get the vaccine and we're experiencing difficulty in getting the vaccine into the black communities. Uh, so for example, uh, here in the Birmingham area where we have a large uh, historical black high school, Parker High School, where well, many of the uh, African-Americans from Alabama that went into medical school graduated from that school. When it came time to actually start uh, vaccine, uh, providing the vaccine to that community, uh, we had educated them. They were ready uh, to take the vaccine. They lo started lining up at 4 a.m. and they only sent them a hundred vials of the vaccine. And so all of the work that we were doing to encourage them to come out, we almost undid that in one day. I would love to report that that was just one single incident, but then it happened again. And so we are trying to work with those here at the state level to say that we are indeed ready as African-American nurses, Hispanic nurses, we're working together with them. We're working together with the Filipino nurses. So we're saying we're ready to go into and to provide the vaccine. We're educating. Uh, the local chapter has been on the radio 
every Saturday since January the 2nd, educating and encouraging people to come out and take this vaccine. We've been holding webinars. So we're ready to do this. Now in other location within the country, because we're in 34 different states plus DC. The story is a little different when I go out and talk to someone out in California. One of my chapters out there last week, the nurses have to give a thousand vaccines and they already have scheduled for the next three weeks to repeat that. Uh, so in terms of partnering with our physicians and partnering with the health departments and other, we're ready to do that. And we do believe from what we're seeing is that we have people that are ready to take the vaccine. Uh, I don't think at this time our hesitancy is any worse than what we see in other population, including the majority white population. But if you don't have the vaccine, we cannot con continue to say that a person is hesitant. Good. Get us the vaccine and let us work with them. Thank you so much, uh, Martha. We really appreciate those comments. And now let me turn to Dr. Judy Greenlee Taylor, who is a private practitioner and public health consultant in her dental practice and is a past president of the National Dental Association. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuxen, um, for this wonderful invitation and in bringing oral health professionals to the table to um, give a perspective. And on behalf of the National Dental Association, I'm just honored to be here and bring our voice <clears throat> to the table. Um, I wanted to start off by saying oral health professionals have really been at the forefront of the pandemic. Of course, our offices were closed for many months during the pandemic in the early days. Um, and then as offices started opening up, you know, we were brought to the forefront even on antigen and antibody testing. Um, and then now most recently, we are excited of the HHS amendment to the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, where now dentists and dental students can now actually um, administer the COVID vaccine. And right now it's primarily in mass distribution sites. So we are really working with our oral health community to advocate for them to get out and volunteer. They can go to their state um, public health sites to sign up to volunteer. We additionally will have links to many resources on the ndaonline.org site where they can go and they can sign up to um, volunteer for these vaccinations. And then the supplies start increasing. We look um, we're excited for the opportunity when the vaccines are rolled out to primary care offices because we want to make sure that dental offices are not overlooked. Surveys have shown that many times Americans will go to their dentist before they will even go to any other health practitioner. So this poses a great opportunity. And what better practitioner it has the requisite knowledge of giving injections than um, oral health providers. So we're happy to be at the table to aid in that. Um, we are have been working with our providers, educating them. We do know research is showing uh, more co oral manifestations of COVID. So working with our providers to learn more on how to navigate that, what to look for. And then, like I said, providing resources on training. You know, when they get to that point where they are a uh, vaccine site, uh, training and the CDC modules, how to take those modules on that. Um, we're not in this alone. So we are working collectively with the Society of American Indian Dentists, as well as the Hispanic Dental Association. And we also stand in unity with our Asian American and Pacific Islander colleagues and their communities. But um, our organizations will be hosting a multicultural summit this summer, and we will continue this conversation on COVID and how to best address our communities, you know, tapping into culturally sensitive information um, from the African-American community. We're very excited to see more faith-based organizations opening up because we know that's a hallmark of trust a lot of times in the African-American community. So we're looking forward to seeing how as oral health professionals, we can continue the conversation and aid in everything, you know, that all the other efforts that are going on, we absolutely commend blackdoctor.org and uh, the BCAC and all the work that you're doing, Dr. Tuxon. And, you know, as we work with the organizations on this panel, 
you know, the agencies and organizations, we invite them to include, you know, be included in the conversation as we talk about this more from an oral health professional standpoint. So we invite them to participate with our summit as well. And then on every federal, state, local level, it's vital to include oral health professionals on those task force, on those um, committees, because they bring a great perspective. We've been at the forefront of, of infectious disease and and um, environmental issues since the beginning. So, you know, it's important to include them at the table on these committees and these task force. Well, I'm so glad that, uh, I'm so glad we included you and this is great. So thank you for being with us. Uh, Sometimes we don't remember, or many of the people in the policy leadership positions don't realize how often and how important the role of private physicians offices and private dentist offices are in vaccinating. But we have with us today for a few words, Anne-Marie Gothard, who serves on the corporate board of the National Dental Association and also works at Henry Schein as a vice president of global and corporate media relations. Anne-Marie. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for inviting us to be important or join this important conversation you're having tonight in today's um, town hall. Um, Just want to share a little bit that, you know, Henry Schein supports a broad array of providers in many settings, uh, many of whom are frontline office based and community health providers, as you know, serve in community health centers, independent practices, urgent care centers, and then the government. We're here with you today because this is at the core of what we do. We're one of the nation's largest distributors of flu vaccines, and we serve more than 1 million healthcare providers, and over 600,000 of them are primary channel for vaccinations. Being close to this critical part of the healthcare infrastructure has really given us some insights into public health needs. And one of the things that we've learned over the many years in which we've been working is that healthcare has far to go before we reach the goal of health equity. And there are many, there may be no single solution to this issue, but our experience has really taught us that we can't get there unless we engage the community. We invest in creating cultural competency through the healthcare um, chain and we support diverse professionals. And as you mentioned, that's why I'm so pleased to be part of the NDA's corporate board. We've been partnering closely with the Black Coalition Against COVID for several months now, thinking about how we can all come together to strengthen equitable access to the COVID-19 vaccine. As shared this evening, um, primary care physicians are a vital resource to the COVID vaccination effort because of the high level of trust that you enjoy among your patients, your understanding of their health history and personal circumstances, as well as your personal presence, preference or personal presence in every community across the country, and that's what's so vitally important. We've made substantial progress in vaccinations, and we applaud what the administration's focus on health equity, but as discussed tonight, we recognize that there is a lag in vaccination rates, and we're continuing to see this, particularly in communities of color, in rural communities, and among the elderly and the disabled. In this context, I just want to add one last thing is that we think it's important to really strengthen this and make sure that we really are in close partnership with community-based, faith-based organizations and that they have the dedicated resources they need, especially so they can reach the the communities and the people that rely on them. So thank you for allowing us to be part of the conversation and to continue this partnership. I'm so glad you got to make that last point, Anne-Marie, because it is vital that we have that connectivity between our office-based health professionals and our community-based organizations. I think this is going to be key as we make partnerships to be able to provide the vaccinations uh, on site uh, where people live convenient to them. I think Winston Wong was really eloquent about this point uh, with his example of the Dodger Stadium. So thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for joining and making that point. And now to close out this panel, I'm really pleased that uh, Dr. Lakeisha Butler, who is the immediate past president of the National Pharmaceutical Association and a clinical professor of pharmacy practice, director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. Dr. Butler. Yes, good good evening, everyone. And certainly thank you for having me. Um, I am, it is my pleasure to represent pharmacists in the National Pharmaceutical Association. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about the National Pharmaceutical Association. We are dedicated to representing the views and ideas of minority pharmacists on critical issues affecting healthcare and pharmacy, but we're also uh, representing and promoting racial and health equity. And so as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine, there's a couple of words that come to mind. Oftentimes pharmacists are that forgotten link to uh, the important 
immunization ecosystem. And so a couple of a couple of uh, words come to mind when I think about pharmacists. We are accessible. Nine out of 10 Americans live near a pharmacy, which creates significant accessibility. And this accessibility has forged trusting relationships. And so we are trusted in the communities that we serve, also yielding us as one of the most honest and trusted healthcare professionals. And that trust is very valuable when addressing vaccine hesitancy. Most pharmacists are trained, so we are trained vaccinators, including pharmacy support staff, and also just recently with the updated PrEP Act, um, our retired pharmacists are able to, to provide vaccinations, therefore further increasing our accessibility. And we are quite knowledgeable and experienced in the area of vaccinations. Our major community pharmacies have been a part of the current COVID-19 vaccination plans. But as uh, Dr. Dawson mentioned, you know, we have, we're, we're providing education to our communities and they are crossing over to actually want to get vaccinated, but they are not being able to, to get the vaccine because of, once again, access. That's been a, bit, been a recurring theme that we've heard tonight. Uh, so the, the access and the way that we can certainly play a part is making sure that pharmacies, because we are um, around and we are um, usually oftentimes, uh, you know, very, very much so the, the individuals that um, patients come to before they may even go to their physician or just if they are in the meantime waiting to get in to see their, their physician. And so because of that accessibility and inc increasing the access of the vaccines within our pharmacies and not just focusing in on the major community pharmacies, but also your independent pharmacies that are oftentimes located in under-resourced areas and not receiving the, the vaccine. Uh, the other part is, is making sure, we are making sure that we're role models in our communities. And so we are getting vaccinated, we're educating, we're partnering with other organizations so that we are providing culturally sensitive information, videos, uh, patient education, so that uh, our the patients that we serve know exactly what information they need to know to make an informed decision. And that's really the important piece. We, we want to serve as role models. We are trained vaccinators. We're educators. We're trusted. We're, we're accessible. And so we are a critical piece in this immunization uh, distribution of, of the COVID-19 vaccine. And, and so I just really appreciate you including us. Uh, we, we certainly want to continue to be a part of the conversation. We want to continue to be a part of the, the efforts as it relates to, to getting folks vaccinated. The other piece is we're able to vaccinate kids. So from the age of three to 18. And so right now I know we're vaccinating adults, but when the time comes, we're also able to vaccinate kids. So thank you so much for, for including us tonight. And thanks for rounding out this comprehensive healthcare team perspective. We appreciate it very much, Dr. Butler. And now we turn more towards the science and clinical medicine uh, part of our program as we get into the perspectives on the science of vaccines and what's going on with therapeutics. I'm pleased to welcome to the conversation, Dr. Vicki Cardenas. Uh, Dr. Cardenas, you are the study responsible scientist for many of Janison's clinical trials. And we know how important clinical trials are. This is where we begin, obviously, to understand whether or not a new vaccine or therapeutic is going to be effective. Uh, what have you learned from your work in engaging underrepresented patients in getting them into the drug development process? Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's really an honor and a privilege for Janssen to be here at this table. Um, I, I think what we've learned is that sponsors need to make diversity a priority early in the clinical trial development process. They need to execute on that strategy. For example, with Ensemble, our, our one dose uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we created a study specific strategy that included dedicated teams and a dedicated budget to make sure that we enrolled those minority populations. And to measure progress, sponsors need to plan for adjustments to the strategy in real time. So they need to be able to do daily report reviews and site level check-ins on a daily basis and pivot as needed. And what do you suggest that the members of this audience can do to be helpful 
or more helpful in getting folks enrolled in clinical trials uh, uh, because we really they have an important role to play, I think. Absolutely. I think those of us of color have a, an inherent responsibility to our communities to become involved in research seeking opportunities, to become PIs, to uh, identify opportunities for our patients. And also we have the responsibility to partner with sponsors to shape the future of clinical trials by ensuring that they're more diverse, they're more inclusive, and they're more equitable. Thank you so much. And now I'm happy to bring in to the conversation, Dr. Janet Woodcock. Uh, Dr. Woodcock's uh, work is uh, work that I have followed for many years with, with a great deal of respect. Uh, you are now the acting commissioner of food and drugs since January 20th of 21. Before that, and very apropos to this conversation, you served as the director of the FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, where you oversaw the center's work uh, in what is now considered by everyone the world's gold standard for drug approval and safety. From your perspective, how concerned are you about the adequacy of clinical trials, uh, enrollment in people of color, and has that been a hindrance uh, in the work that you do? Well, it's been a hindrance in the sense that we still aren't where we need to be. As thank you very much for inviting me here because this is really one of my passions. And I believe that this uh, pandemic and the realizations uh, about this issue that have arisen really provide an opportunity. When I was at the Center for Drugs, I started the Snapshots program. And there we publish for every new, new drug that gets on the market, novel drug, uh, the demographics of the pivotal trials. So we can see who was enrolled. And in fact, there has been significant progress from before in, in enrolling women and uh, minorities in, into the clinical trials. But you know, these trials still don't look like America and we aren't reaching all the places we need to reach. So what I think we can do now, which is a tremendous opportunity, is really reach out into the community and support PIs and researchers, as was just said, in the community. That's what we need to do. We can't expect people to come to major medical centers. We, can't expect them to leave their ordinary providers. So we have to set up research support out there in the community. You know, FDA has done everything we have been able to do. We've, start, we've started an initiative on diversity of clinical trials. In November, we issued a guidance on um, and, you know, how to get good diversity in clinical trials and better enrollment, and more representative enrollment and so forth. But these are all sort of the passive ways. The active way is really to reach out and support uh, the people who are on this webinar, okay? And so to be able to participate in clinical research and enroll your patients at your site into the clinical research enterprise. And I think that's the way that we're truly going to be represented. This will require more resources to be put into those sites because they don't have the resources that other sites have ordinarily, but it, it will be worth it because it will provide us with a, a enrollees who look like America. Well, this is a very welcome set of comments, uh, Dr. Woodcock, because I will tell you that the Black Coalition Against COVID uh, and, and our partners, particularly in the academic environment for minority academic centers, is going to be knocking on the door for better collaboration. And I think with the Biden-Harris administration in place now, I think that there will be an even more receptive ear. So uh, you, 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 what you had to say falls on very welcome ears by my, from me. That's great. Um, I want to switch now to talk about vaccines, and I cannot think of a better person than uh, to bring into the conversation with our other two guests is Dr. Barney Graham, who is the Deputy Director for Vaccine Research Center at NIA, NIAID at NIH. He's also the Chief of the Viral Pathogenesis Lab. I have to tell the audience that Dr. Graham is a, an unknown uh, face to many of you, but he is absolutely one of the true heroes of this uh, pandemic response. It was on January 6th when he mobilized a scientific army to get the coronavirus sequence out of Wuhan, China and rushed to structure it and to produce a vaccine uh, based on his earlier work with uh, MERS uh, 
uh, COV. Uh, and so uh, this is a story that whenever people ask us, and I would urge all of my colleagues listening, when people are always asking us, how did you do it so fast? How did you do it so fast? In large measure, it was done so fast because of the leadership and the foresight of Dr. Barney Graham. And so I'm happy to welcome you to the uh, show. And uh, could you, Dr. Graham, tell us a little bit about the lessons that you have learned from being able to mobilize as swiftly as you did? And what are we going to need to be able to do to make sure we will be able to mobilize as swiftly in the future? Thank you, Reed, for the opportunity to be here and for those kind words. Um, I'm glad to answer this question. It's the first question I get almost every time is how did we go so fast? Uh, this was uh, started around the 10th of January uh, based on the sequences that were released from China. And within 10 months, we had an answer that the vaccine was working. And that was done through every stage of evaluation in animals and people without skipping any steps. And it was done largely because uh, of all the funding that was put into this process to do a lot of things in parallel, including manufacturing. We were able to start so fast because of the prior work we had done with Moderna on proving that their mRNA vaccines worked against the MERS coronavirus. We knew how to design the MERS coronavirus based on our work uh, from respiratory syncytial virus several years before that, and we knew how to find those answers based on our 20 years of work on HIV vaccine development at the Vaccine Research Center. So it, this indeed has been a long uh, process and, and it's not just been me, it's been a lot of other people. My uh, research fellow in my lab, uh, Dr. Kizmikia Corbett has been, I've known her since high school, but she's been in, back in my lab again after PhD since uh, 2014 and her project on the coronavirus to, to understand its structure, to understand how to stabilize the protein in the right shape and uh, map the antibody binding sites and then do all the studies with RNA is what helped set us up in this position to, to respond in this way. And so there is a big story behind the, the speed and we hope that this can be a paradigm changing uh, type of thing uh, for future efforts. Do you have enough money, by the way, just to be sure, uh, to make sure that we are prepared for the future? We are very fortunate and blessed at the Vaccine Research Center, which is an intramural program on the NIH campus in the institute run by Dr. Tony Fauci. And we have a very generous budget and uh, it is a federally funded lab. Uh, we don't have to write grants. So we do the work that we think is important for public health and we are well funded to do that. Thank you so much. Dr. Woodcock, uh, can you talk to us about the approval process? Uh, again, uh, Dr. Graham has done a great job of saying that uh, how we were able to go as quickly as we were to creating uh, vaccines. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, how competent and safe our approval process is. Well, um, although all this was very fast, there weren't corners cut and the uh, trials were huge, 30,000 people or more, and they did have significant minority participation, although that was kind of somewhat of a lift and, and there had to be, uh, there was a great effort was put into that. The people at the FDA, in fact, uh, went through very carefully and are very confident in the results for the emergency use authorizations for these vaccines. So we do not think corners were cut. And um, Dr. Tuxen, I think you asked me uh, on the side, were there minority physicians, for example, on the advisory committee? Uh, yes, indeed. That's something we're very curious about, absolutely. Yeah, and the vaccine advisory committee has seven um, members who, uh, who are there. Are three uh, um, Black Americans, um, three Asian Americans, and one Hispanic American on that committee. So there's good representation there. Well, one thing we also will hope for, uh, Dr. Woodcock, as you are the 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 acting, and you're always going to be a leader, no matter what you wind up doing, uh, is that we hope that will be even more. Because if we've learned anything from trying to talk to communities of color about accepting this vaccine, it is 
how do we know that people of color are involved? And I think this has taught us uh, that we need to have more people of color on these review committees. And I, I have a sense that you have uh, good hearing for that and, and receptivity. So uh, we're glad to make that, that point. Well, you're singing my song. I mean, I think we need to get out more into the communities and have those uh, community providers participating in the research uh, so that uh, they can be voices. We participated. We uh, did some of this research. We contributed in addition to having people. Uh, the FDA, the agency itself, is quite diverse uh, population of people from all over the world. But I think um, people listen best, as it's already been said on this call, to the folks they know, the people they interact with, the people they trust every day. Well, thank you very much. And let me turn, Dr. Graham, to you and an area that I know you are particularly passionate about, and that's the therapeutics, and particularly in monoclonal antibody. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what that's, what those agents are and how they, what they do and how, how they should be used. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, one of the fortunate byproducts of the new technologies that allow us to make vaccines and understand things at the atomic level, knowing the structure of these proteins, is we can make proteins that can be used to discover new antibodies, as we did with Abcellera. And it's the antibody 555 that Lilly helped develop. So, but the Bamlin Nivimab antibody, there's other antibodies on the market as well, but these uh, antibodies, because of these new technologies, one of the, that byproduct is, is discovery. The antibodies themselves uh, are able, this is what we're trying to make with our vaccines, but the antibodies themselves can be made in a factory and then given to people. And in this case for coronavirus, if they're given to people with mild or moderate symptoms relatively early in the course, they're very effective at stopping the progression into hospitalization. So these antibodies um, have been approved for emergency use in people over 65 and in people over 12 with uh, risk factors uh, that would make them more susceptible to severe disease. And I think they're being underutilized overall and in, in some care providers don't seem to know about them. So it's something that I, I really hope can be recognized as a, as a way to keep people who are infected out of the hospital. Thank you. As we bring Dr. Ernesto Oveda Orta into the conversation, I will say to you, Dr. Graham, that uh, this was one of the explicit purposes of this town hall tonight was to uh, really shine a very bright light on the underuse of, of, these, uh, of these therapeutics. It is so important that our clinicians uh, know about it and can talk about it. And so to that extent, uh, uh, Ernesto, um, you are the infectious disease lead uh, in, in the medical affairs group at Regeneron. And so you've got an antibody cocktail that you are uh, leading the development of. Can you talk a bit about that? Please? Yes, uh, thank you so much. And I'm really privileged to be here uh, speaking with you today and representing the hundreds of scientists that have really made a huge impact in, 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 in society and, and health with this monoclonal antibody uh, combination. Um, I have to say uh, bef before I start describing the monoclonal antibodies that there is a lag period. There is a delay in, in, in between the moment you get in contact with the virus and the moment in which your immune response is capable of mounting an appropriate immune response. Is that period that puts you the more at risk. And is the period in which, in, in which our monoclonal antibody combination have the most effect. The early you, be, you, you are diagnosed and treated, the, the better. So our antibodies are called casiribimab and mindevimab, and they are two monoclonal antibodies that recognize two independent and non-competing epitopes on the receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein thus blocking not only the infectivity, but uh, through the fusion, uh, blocking the fusion and the entrance of the virus to the host cells. So these two monoclonal antibodies are currently authorized for treatment of mild to moderate uh, coronavirus disease by the FDA in adults and pediatric patients which are um, uh, older than 12 years of age and, and with a weight of more than uh, 40 kilograms with positive PCR results and who have um, you know, a high risk 
for progressing to severe COVID-19. It's important to, to highlight that this monoclonal antibody uh, combination is not um, um, approved for um, patients that are hospitalized due to COVID-19, patients who require oxygen therapy due to COVID-19, patients who, are, um, who require increased um, baseline oxygen flow rates uh, due to COVID-19 and which have, which have the need for chronic oxygen therapy due to underlying non-COVID-19 uh, comorbidities. Great. Well, thank you so much. Dr. Woodcock, just uh, again, back to the review process uh, for these uh, drugs and the combinations of drugs. How different uh, or are the issues that are presented to the review body uh, as you make uh, approval recommendations and then give guidance to our audience as they are, uh, when they read uh, your, the conclusions of your uh, uh, recommendations, uh, uh, how, how different are, 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 are these issues from the vaccine issues? Well, they were somewhat different. I was actually, I have to say, I was the therapeutic lead for what was called Operation Warp Speed. So I was in charge of the government side of getting these monoclonal antibodies uh, developed and purchased and available, but not distributed. That was another group. Um, there, were, there were issues with, um, with the monoclonals because although I believe they developed very convincing information early. It wasn't the traditional information that you usually see because there wasn't time. So it was shown with a several of the monoclonals, they decreased viral load in the patient and outpatients. They shortened symptoms and they, uh, there were only a few hospitalizations, but they were mainly in the placebo group. Okay. And that happened several times. So the FDA felt put together all that information, along with the fact that they weren't that toxic. Uh, they had very few side effects other than infusion reactions. The FDA went ahead and did emergency use authorizations. But one of the issues with the slow uptake was that a lot of groups were still waiting for that randomized controlled trial, you know, with clinical endpoints. Those have come. And what they have shown is there's about a 70% reduction in hospitalization and mortality combined. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? That is very, very important information to hear. There's about a 70% reduction in hospitalization or mortality combined. And that's across multiple different trials that have been done with multiple different antibody right. combinations. And so we can keep most of our patients out of the hospital and we can save lives if we administer this early along uh, as the uh, two and uh, my two uh, co-panelists have gone through the conditions. You want to take high risk people because the lower risk people are making antibodies and they're going to get better and clear the virus on their own, most of them. But these high risk people are not doing that. And this arrests the progression of disease in, in many, many patients, and they actually recover. Uh, we don't know yet if it will actually help with the um, long COVID syndrome. We don't know that yet, but they aren't getting that severe disease and not getting in the hospital. And we have real world evidence from a lot of large healthcare systems like Mayo, Intermountain, others, and they've had extremely good results with these. The only problem we have right now is the generation of variants that are arising um, spontaneously with so much virus replication going on. In some cases, uh, these variants are not so susceptible to a monoclonal. Uh, the Regeneron monoclonal looks like it covers all the uh, variants in the United States right now. So, but we're, we have to keep an eye on that. So we've put out, and along with, uh, with HHS, we've put out a lot of information about how to handle variants. It should be familiar with, to providers because it's much like antimicrobial resistance. You need to use the, use the agent that the organisms in your area are susceptible to. Basically, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Woodcock. I appreciate it. Let me quickly bring in Dr. Brian Anderson, uh, who is the chief digital health physician at the prestigious company called MITRE. 
a consulting not-for-profit that works in the public interest across federal, state, and local governments, as well as with industry and academia. Uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, give you some thoughts around, as you are a strategic thinker, uh, about what's going on, why it's not these efforts, these uh, these uh, therapeutics are not being used as often as they should be, and uh, what can we be doing to get the right people to these therapies at the right time? Well, thanks for having me here, Reed. I think you know, just to echo what Dr. Woodcock just shared, and I've had the pleasure of working with her and her team in Operation Warp Speed uh, for some time now. One of the challenges has really been identifying the right populations and getting the therapies to them at the right time. And so monoclonals is a great example where, you know, from my perspective, it is a it is a underutilized therapy. Um, as Dr. Woodcock mentioned, and I think really a point to drive home here tonight, monoclonals have the ability to save lives in a pretty profound way, reducing hospitalization and mortality rates uh, ranging between 70 and 80 percent. And so, you know, that being said, there's a lot of uh, wonderful uh, effort that are great examples and stories to share. And one example at MITRE, um, you know, in partnership with Operation Warp Speed and the federal government is a coalition of private industry leaders, the White House COVID response team, uh, through a coalition called The Fight Is In Us. Uh, that The goal of that broad coalition, which is a group of blood plasma donation centers, is to support the equitable collection and distribution of convalescent plasma, as well as supporting more broadly antibody-derived therapies like monoclonal antibodies and vaccines. I think it's important to mention that fundamental to an effort like this, that where it pulls together private industry, government, local communities and tribes working towards that equitable distribution and equitable utilization is getting the message out from the trusted, uh, the trusted healthcare professionals, from the trusted local community leaders. Uh, the most impactful work that we've done at MITRE in partnership with the federal government has always been working with the trusted voices, the trusted faces, and that trusted message that follows science. And so when, when I reflect back on what can minority health professionals do to enhance the kind of appropriate use to drive that kind of utilization with things like monoclonals, it always starts with working with the local community. Uh, you know, one of the things we do a lot at MITRE is build digital health tools um, to help engage, to identify, to reach out to individuals that are at risk or in vulnerable populations. Uh, the most important key to all of that, though, is working with healthcare providers to understand how to engage the community where they're at. As Winston was sharing, being able to speak their language engaging with pastors, engaging with elders in the communities or tribes. These are all really important steps that we as healthcare professionals, dentists, nurses, social workers, doctors um, should be taking. Another really important thing I think that healthcare professionals need to understand is, is how do you use these therapies, right? I, you know, going to medical school and training and residency and in practice, uh, you don't necessarily train as a primary care physician on how to uh, refer or prescribe an infusion for monoclonals or how to, where to recommend a patient to go for donation for plasma. But these are really important things that healthcare professionals need to be aware of right now and need to understand how do you refer to, how do you refer your patients that may be part of those vulnerable populations to know where to go to get a monoclonal infusion, to understand if they qualify for one, and to understand, you know, a lot of the, the questions around, well, who's gonna pay for this? And mm -hmm. are there prior authorizations or things like that? And so there are a number of resources that, uh, that healthcare professionals can go to, combatcovid.hhs.gov is one, thefightisinus.org is another. So I think check out your resources, get educated and get the message out. I'm so important. glad you made it that clear. And I think that we've really got to understand it is very difficult for physicians and other health professionals around this country to know where to go to even send their patient uh, to get mm -hmm. these therapies. It is also right. clear that patients don't know, families don't know. And so mm -hmm. I'm really calling upon all of my colleagues listening in on this town hall. This is, needs to be something we make 
a high priority for our personal and our society agendas, our, our, our society's professional society's agenda, because uh, again, the disparities in this are just as bad, if not worse, than the disparities we're seeing across the board. Well, I want to thank our panelists extremely much. Uh, Dr. Graham, thank you. Dr. Woodcock, Dr. Oveda Orta, and Dr. Anderson, you have really helped us to shine a bright light on an important issue. Thank you so much for joining us, and you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now for our last panel, we want to turn to the issue of how do we as health professionals do a better job of communicating this important set of agenda uh, items, whether it is enrollment in clinical trials, whether it is vaccine acceptance, whether it is uh, availability of monoclonal antibodies, how do we talk with our patients and do it in a better way? I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Alicio Perez Stabal. Uh, Alicio is a good friend to all of us. Uh, we know him well and we respect him highly as the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, at the National Institutes of Health. He has also been a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at UCSF. Hey, Elysio, thanks a lot for, for taking the time to join us today. And you gotta take yourself off mute and then we'll be able to, to in, enjoy uh, your comments about what it is that we can do better as we talk to our patients. Thank you very much, Reed. Uh, inevitably, that happens every time, right? <laughs> Somebody does that. Doesn't take yourself off mute. Uh, but I, I, I'm a, it's a real honor to be here with you today and all of you out there. Great. So what are your thoughts about and what have you, as you are, are learning from, from your research and, and your just engagement out there when speaking to patients, what is it that we uh, can be doing a better job uh, to be able to talk to our patients and address the misinformation about uh, COVID-19, which is overwhelmingly prevalent? I think the first thing as clinicians is to really check yourself, uh, check the jargon at the door, uh, really speak plainly, directly to the facts, to the science that's available. Let the patient, let the people ask you their questions they frequently sound completely out of it. Uh, oh, are they putting a chip in me to monitor me? Or can I get COVID from the vaccine? Uh, because they have heard all this misinformation about COVID, like many other things, uh, in social media, on the radio, or their friends, uh, or somebody told them, told somebody and told them. I, I think the important thing is for us to listen carefully to their concerns address their concerns directly with facts and with authority as a clinician, also caring and trusting a messenger that we all know how to do from our training and our experience. Are you, um, from your position at NIH, and you are one of the world's great experts on research in, 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 in healthcare uh, disparities and diversity, uh, can we expect a, 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 an augmentation of the research portfolio at, uh, out of your office at NIH around these issues of understanding uh, in different uh, ethnic cultures how to better communicate? Absolutely. And in fact, we've already launched into that. Uh, at the NIH, we uh, have launched a, a large program to promote testing in underserved populations. We call RADx UP or uh, rapid acceleration to diagnostics for underserved populations. This was a $500 million allocation from Congress. We're partnering with National Institute on Aging and the Office of the Director. My colleagues, we've funded 69 uh, studies already in 33 states and the territory of Puerto Rico. And we plan to have a second phase coming up later this year. We're trying to learn how we can do better testing and evaluation in our communities so that we can decrease and eliminate these disparities that have really been incredible. The, the, the kind of disparity we've seen from COVID is really unparalleled in almost any other acute or chronic condition that we know. Uh, and because it happened so quickly and so many, so many people have died, uh, it really has put this in the forefront. We've had other activities. There's the Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID-19, uh, partnering with the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute and supported by the National Institute on Allergy and Infectious Disease, as well as the Office of the Director. We've launched a campaign to really address directly the misinformation, utilize you and other 
colleagues and other partners as trusted messengers, initially for participating in clinical trials and misinformation, and now pivoting towards uptake of the vaccine. One other question, uh, so what about the role that these societies that are watching you today, and you've got uh, the entire uh, portfolio of, of all of the, of the elements that are part of your office, how can they be more in, in, in more effectively engaged with you and your office at NIH? Well, I'm, I'm a general internist, so I, 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 it resonates with me, even though I'm not seeing uh, practicing medicine right now. You're so critical in this in this uh, issue. Um, everyone thinks or thought, oh, if we can only get uh, some celebrity to do a promo for the vaccine or for the clinical trial, or if we can only get you know, everyone believes that the only way to get to the African-American community is through the black church. And yes, it matters. It matters. It matters a lot. Uh, all of pastors and ministers and rabbis and priests are important in this. But healthcare professionals are automatically trusted uh, by most people on issues related to health. That's been shown time and time again with research. And yes, pharmacists, dentists, nurses, uh, physicians and all kinds of healthcare professionals really matter. And so we are greatly appreciative as well as our populations of this effort. Thank you, LSAO. And uh, again, uh, to all the folks in our audience, we have a friend in LSAO. Absolutely. Uh, we should use him. We should take advantage of his office and we should study the information that comes out of, uh, out of his office because it is useful to us in what we do. Uh, thank you so much. Let me turn to two uh, people uh, who are going to come now, who are experts in this issue of communicating around the COVID messaging. Uh, Dr. Rhea Board, I will, Boyd, I will start with, a pediatrician and public health advocate and scholar who writes and teaches on the relationship between structural racism, inequity, and health. She co-developed something called The Conversation, Between Us, About Us, a national campaign to bring information about the COVID vaccines directly to Black uh, communities. Uh, Dr. Boyd, would you talk a little bit about this project? And I think that um, Ellis is going to stream, and he is, in fact, uh, the website so that those of you who will be interested can go um, uh, and, and follow up on that after the show is over. Uh, but as you take yourself off of mute, Dr. Boyd, um, uh, talk to us about what you're doing and, and who you're working with. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Tuxin. So the conversation is a um, partnership between the Kaiser Family Foundation and Black Coalition Against COVID to co-develop a national campaign to just talk directly to Black folks from Black doctors, nurses, and researchers right into Black communities about their major concerns about the COVID vaccines. And what uh, you did, I know, extensive market research. And uh, usually uh, clinicians are, do not have access to that kind of, of, of extensive market research and focus groups. Uh, tell us what you basically the take homes were uh, that, that we can use as we talk to uh, patients and to our community groups. So a critical part of this partnership has been the polling work that Kaiser Family Foundation has been doing throughout the pandemic to better understand how people are understanding COVID vaccination and what might move them closer to vaccination. And what we know for communities of color, particularly for Black and Latinx communities, is that over time, an increasing proportion of folks, when they're asked, are saying they want to get vaccinated. Now there's only about 20% or one out of five folks who say that they may not get vaccinated when their turn comes. But there's still about a third of folks in the Black and Latinx groups who are waiting to see. Among the folks who are waiting to see, their primary concerns are common concerns we see across racial and ethnic groups. People's number one concern is about side effects. People want to know if they're going to have side effects and if so, what those side effects are. The other top concerns are about cost related to the vaccine, about potentially missing work because of side effects, uh, and about whether the vaccines are free. And so our information is meant to tailor directly to those concerns and answer Answer those questions. The vaccines are free. The side effects, while mild to moderate, are uh, severe side effects are incredibly rare. Um, and that if folks are concerned about missing work, the Johnson & Johnson platform might be a great vaccine for you uh, because there are less associated side effects. So we have answers to all of these questions on our website, www.betweenusaboutus.org. Good. I'll come back to you in just a minute, but I want to turn very quickly to uh, Kelly Richardson Lawson. Uh, who is the CEO of the Joy uh, Collective. 
Uh, Kelly, you are an Emmy award-winning creative visionary and entrepreneurial business leader with more than 25 years of leadership experience in television, entertainment, marketing, consumer packaged goods, goods, book publishing, and technology. Uh, your company uh, has also been producing some incredible video uh, and internet uh, content. Give us a sense of what you have learned uh, through the course of your market uh, testing. And by the way, uh, we are putting that website across the scrolling so people can go to that as well um, um, after the show. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, Dr. Tuxen, with you and all these esteemed guests. Um, it's my honor to be with you this evening. What we've learned with our work with the Ad Council and COVID Collaborative is that um, with what we're doing around their campaign, which is really called It's Up To You, uh, we've learned it's important to first and foremost acknowledge the Black community and the distrust that we have for good reason. Um, and we want to make sure that we are acknowledging the top concerns and the key questions and then ensuring that we're helping our community get answers to those concerns. Um, the creative that we've developed underneath that halo campaign called It's Up To You is really uh, focused on the Black community in three big areas. One, starting with empathy and understanding, saying that we understand that you have issues or you have questions, you have concerns, and you may have um, hesitancy, again, for good reason. Second, we wanted to create a campaign that was really authentic to what our community is missing most and those moments that we missed most. And I heard a gentleman speak earlier about the faith-based community. We know how critical it is for our community to get back to going to church in person. And so we've created a campaign around those moments that we miss most. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that we created a campaign that was not at all focused on pointing fingers or adding any sort of incremental burden to us, but really grounded in uh, empathy grounded in understanding of what matters most to our community, and then um, just real talk. And so that is the campaign that we've created. Let's go over those uh, those points uh, one by one very briefly again. I, I think mm -hmm. they're very important. So if I heard you correctly, number one, it had to do with empathy uh, yes. as a place to start. I think you also said something about it's okay to ask questions. Can you review those again, please? Sure. So the first one was really being empathetic to the situation that we face as Black people in this country and the historic, um, you know, the issues, whether it's the Tuskegee experiment or many other factors, the fact that only 5% of doctors in this country are Black. And so we have inherent um, distrust for good reason. And so we need to be empathetic. So the empathy piece is really important. And then second, um, ask, making sure that we're saying in the creative, it's okay to have questions. We have answers for you. And so here's where you can get the answers. Another thing I mentioned is just being authentic to what are those moments that matter most to us, uniquely to us, whether it's going to an HBCU and whether it's pledging. You know, we have a spot where you see, um, you know, men pledging and those things are not happening now. Going to church, critically important for our community. 84% of our community um, says that they go to church and they want to get back to church. So those are some of the things I mentioned. And then lastly, not pointing fingers, not adding um, any additional stressors to our community and just simply being a resource. So we built a whole toolkit of assets that are available. I think it is scrolling across the bottom they're available at blackcommunityvaccinetoolkit.org. So a series of TV spots, print ads, you know, banner ads. People can use all of it. It's rights free and it's available for organizations. Again, everybody in the audience, if you need video content uh, that 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 is compelling, well produced, uh, easy to use. Uh, connecting with internet resources and social media resources, you have a kind of a complete toolkit that you can, uh, you can get uh, through the work of the Joy Collective. But let me go back also to, uh, to Dr. Boyd, because uh, you also um, have, I think, a, a pretty complete package of information as well. And so as you uh, reflect also, uh, Dr. Boyd, on, 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 and give us a sense of what we will find on your site, uh, are there any other the messages that you have found to be useful uh, that will augment the ones that, uh, that Kelly Richardson Lawson just gave us? Yes. 
So we have a wealth of resources as well on our website. Our website's www.betweenusaboutus.org. We right now have a library of 50 frequently asked question videos. So they're 30 second to one minute videos that just answer specific questions like, can I get the vaccine if I'm pregnant? What about this rumor I've heard about the vaccine um, causing concerns about infertility? Uh, we answer all of those questions from experts on our site. Um, and so folks can just scroll through. We also have a YouTube page at Kaiser Family Foundation's Greater Than COVID YouTube page. So if you just Google the conversation between us about us, you can also go to our YouTube page and go down a healthy rabbit hole of video that answer all the questions folks have. But the main messages that we're hearing from Kaiser's data that people really want to hear that will move them from deciding not to get vaccinated to deciding to get vaccinated are two things. One, people want to hear that the vaccines are effective. They want us to share the numbers around effectiveness, and that's really important. And the second is people want to know that when they get the vaccine, that they're protected. And so we are rolling out new videos that are answering those questions around um, efficacy and effectiveness and protection so that people can be sure that when they get these vaccines, they are protected from COVID as a result. And for both of you, are there any resources for uh, people who speak only Spanish? Uh, and are there any resources that you are aware of like this for the, uh, for the Asian and Pacific Islander or Native American community? Our first, um, our first series of videos were featuring Black healthcare providers, and our first series of videos are in English, but we are now rolling out videos in Spanish that will launch in May. So right at the time where all Americans become eligible to receive a COVID vaccine, we will also have all of the information available in Spanish featuring Latinx and Afro-Latinx uh, healthcare workers as well. So check back at uh, Between Us About Us dot org um, in a month or two, and we will also have resources available in Spanish. Right. Yes, and I would just add there is a similar toolkit to the Black Community Toolkit, which is Hispanic Community Vaccine Toolkit dot org, and so there are um, Spanish speaking videos as well as a full suite of content available there. And then lastly, I just want to say, and to Dr. Boyd, love the creative that you've done, phenomenal um, with Dr. Tuxen and the Kaiser Family Foundation. So just want to give a shout out to you on that. It's beautiful. Um, and then lastly, just say um, there's a wealth of answers as well. I mean, there's clearly the point here is there's content and available answers to questions. So there's a website called getvaccineanswers.org that uh, the Ag Council on COVID Collaborative, Collaborative have put together that also has a wealth of answers to very uh, common questions. So I just want well, to I mention that as well. I, I really appreciate that, that and, and both of these project, projects are, we're co-partnering through the BCAC and we think you're both just terrific. Uh, and I hope that you will also take back to the people that you work with who uh, provided the resources to let them know that you were on a show that had Asian and Pacific Islander uh, health yeah. professionals and Native American health professionals and they're kind of going, where's mine? And so let's make we sure- We can do that. that. We are ready, absolutely. Uh, as we close out the, uh, the program tonight, I wanted to end, and we wanted to end with a very special uh, uh, a presentation coming from our colleague, Melissa Haley, uh, LMSW, from the national president, who is the national president of the National Association of Black Social Workers. And, and what I want to make sure that we all appreciate, and, and what, what pains me and does not get covered nearly enough in the media, is the suffering and the pain that so many people are going through as they experience the social determinants of disease, insults uh, that coexist and exacerbate this pandemic. And, and I think our social workers are being so heroic and sheroic as they do their work that we wanted to end our show uh, with a special word and, and comments from Melissa Haley, uh, the uh, national uh, president of the National Association of Black Social Workers. And we may have you on mute still, I think. Let's make sure. Okay, let's try again. Uh-oh, uh, hold on a second. Ellis, uh, are we uh, challenged here? Uh, and uh, Melissa, let's try uh, one more uh, time because we do want to hear from you. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Ellis is, is not on his end. And so let's see, Melissa, um, maybe if you turn your mic on and then off and on again, maybe we will be able to get you.
Oh no, this is terrible. Okay, well, all right, try. There we go. Now let's see. No. Okay, it's. I'm not sure what what happened. Um, it's not on the production side. Um, I tell you what. One alternative would be is why don't you go out and come back in into the studio again? Yeah, why don't you go out and come back into the studio, and I will do my wrap up and then come back to you. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, uh, health professionals, all, uh, we thank you for taking uh, this time to to join us. We want to especially again thank all of our sponsors uh, and and our sponsors. Uh, have been very, very helpful uh, in, in allowing us to make this happen. And so Bio, Henry Shine, and J&J &J Jansen, uh, we appreciate uh, very much uh, your support of the program. I cannot say enough how pleased we are to be, have been joined by the Association of Black Cardiologists, the National Hispanic Medical Association, the Association of American Indian Physicians, and the National Council of Asian and Pacific Islander Physicians. We are as overjoyed that our colleagues from the National Dental Association, Pharmaceutical Association and um, the uh, National uh, Black Social Workers, um, and uh, and even though uh, Melissa is is got a, a slight technical challenge, um, her colleagues are on the line, and I know that if Melissa was able to uh, be able to uh, come back in, uh, that she would comment to us that uh, there is. Uh, in fact, here's Melissa now. Let's see if it works. Oh, it looks like it won't. All right, Melissa. Well, thank you so much for trying. But let me, Melissa, I know from our conversations, and you can just nod your head and, and tell me whether I'm on the right track. But uh, your colleagues are out there in the land trying to figure out how to uh, get food to people that don't have it, trying to get people uh, uh, housing when, they, when they're losing their housing in this challenge, uh, that you're getting people rides to transportation, uh, trying to get people to vaccination sites. You're counseling and talking to people. And um, that work is just so important. And just the fact that you're on screen with us making a visual representation of that work is a very eloquent statement. And we will have you back on our next show for sure. And uh, Melissa, thank you so much. I know it's not your fault and uh, these things do happen. So, but again, you are in the show and the points have been made. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you at the next uh, COVID uh, uh, town hall sponsored by the BCAC. You can watch this show again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time on blackdoctor.org. That's blackdoctor.org. It'll be rebroadcast at 10 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow, and then it will be uh, permanently available on Facebook, uh, but also on YouTube. And so with that, have a good day. Ellis, thank you for your